And hello, everybody. Welcome to Ramble Mancy. Um, we are here with our uh, with our guest, Remy Ripple. Remy, welcome. Um, and of, and of course, standing in for John today, we have Caitlin as hello. our third host. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're just here today. We're going to be talking about um, homebrew content versus uh pre-written modules and we're gonna be talking about all the uh all of our experiences with those things and our opinions about them and just talking all about that kind of stuff but before we do that got a few things to talk about first and foremost um we have new merch in the store um we have in case you missed it last last broadcast wednesday um in case you missed that we actually have some a new hoodie in the store uh it, with the infinite horizon season two art on it look at how cool that is it's just awesome it looks so good on that hoodie um it comes in a couple different colors so that the one that's on there is just sort of is just uh one of i think three that it comes in so yeah um awesome do check that out because uh, it's very cool, and we will let you know. I actually didn't check today, but but I, we we will let you know when the uh, when it's back. The the T-shirt is back in the mm-hmm. Streamlabs store. So, um, yeah. So, um, John, what are you doing? You're supposed to be moving. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm glad uh... to see you, but you're supposed to be moving. Also, uh, since in the spirit of our pre-show announcements, happy birthday, happy John! Happy birthday, John! <laughs> happy yeah. Birthday. Happy John. birthday! It was yesterday, but uh, your birthday Still happened counts. to fall in between stream days. Yes. So you know what happens then? <laughs> well, it's the whole week and weekend, buddy. <laughs> yeah, one time, one time, I literally extended Caitlin's birthday an additional week so that I could embarrass her on stream. So <laughs> <laughs> don't fucking test me, John. Uh, <laughs> um. Anyway, uh. So yeah, uh, happy birthday. Um. Other announcements are that uh, so the new episode of Infinite Horizon is on YouTube today. It went up uh, at noon Pacific today and every Friday, um, so you can check that out there. It's and a very fun and good episode. Was... I'm biased because I was there, but like it was a very fun and good episode. <laughs> it was so good. Um, and then of course, uh, Into Deep the uh, the YouTube release day for Into Deep has changed to Saturdays, so that one will be up at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, noon eastern tomorrow morning tomorrow morning afternoon whatever it's a during um, a time um, a time time is not real yeah so those will be there uh and you can check that out um we'll be back with into deep on tuesday with episode three uh we'll be back at oh, 4 p.m pacific time it will be wild because that group is entirely chaotic like all <laughs> chaos it's just wonderful to watch i was like i literally was like uh like my face hurt after watching them because <laughs> i was laughing so hard the whole time yeah um and of course uh we'll be back on wednesday with infinite horizon at 6 p.m pacific time and uh and we'll be back a week from today with ramble mancy which we'll talk more about as the week begins so um <clears throat> i think that's most of everything caitlin you have a few things that are happening that i know you uh you can I talk do. about very excited about it. Um, if you watch any content that I'm in, you know that I have a uh, I'm in another super ha- super powered show on Sundays on Q Times at 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, but this week we're doing a very special one shot for a charity. It's called Operation Nazi Puncher, and it is <laughs> we're gonna be joined. It's the Power Play cast joined by Darren DePaul, which is extremely cool yeah um and we're doing it's fully fully a one shot so if you haven't seen any power play you can still jump in and come uh raise money for this southern poverty law center uh and it's gonna be a really good time it's gonna be a four hour special rick bud very much likes doing like three like ends on time at three hours all the time so i was very excited when i found out we were doing like an extra long <laughs> extra long game so that's gonna be really fun and i hope y'all can join us because it's gonna be it's gonna be a blast yeah i'm very excited <laughs> Um, all right. Well, and, uh, Remy, did you have anything, did you have anything on right now, going on right now that you wanted to, to push or? 
uh not really like i just have a lot of stuff in the works at Fair the moment enough. So. yeah <laughs> I feel just like follow this Remy. Is, this is yeah, just follow Remy. Yeah. Uh I feel like this is that time of year where that's basically everybody's state. Everybody's like not doing stuff. They're like getting ready to do stuff. Mm-hmm. And, like it's yeah. it's yeah. Uh all right. Well, um we shall begin tonight's episode of Ramblemancy. Um John Let the rambling John's going to begin. Bed. John, sleep well and yeah. good luck with your move. Um, yeah, we miss you, and we'll see you soon. Uh, all right. So I saw a bunch of people in the chat already. I saw Rose. I saw Hessen. Thank you so much for subscribing for eight months. Holy crap! Mm-hmm. Uh, Amethyst Cat Lady, welcome. Jolly Old Up Nixless, Mister Fizzer, welcome back. Um, hold on. Who did I, Who else did I see? I saw. Either them, and of course John, but John is going to bed because John is a responsible person who is going to get enough sleep so that he can move tomorrow. I say in an entirely non-threatening way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway. It's full of love. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so homebrew content versus the other stuff, the pre-written modules. <laughs> modules. <laughs> so, so um, we, uh, we, I don't usually, I mean, we don't have John for me to throw under the bus today. So uh, I think today what we'll do instead is I'll just say, Caitlin, what do you got for us? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't know. I feel like I've, I don't do a lot of module stuff. So mm-hmm. I don't know if I have a ton of, I mean, personally running. Most of the things that I sure. run are like homebrew the closest i think i could do to like pre-written is when i did it came from loop that was a pre-written like universe right but we still homebrewed most of it and i didn't i ran a i wrote the story it wasn't from like it does come with a bunch of modules which i would like to run at some point because they just Mm -hmm. seem fun um but i don't i i when i first started dming i used to like chop up pre-written modules or like modules that people put out online that weren't like official whatever um and like would chop them up and put them together of the pieces that i liked and make little like frankenstein stories and that would run those um but i don't i've never actually run a fully pre-written anything which i feel feel like would be fun at some point maybe take some stress off of me and my 30 page notes for a four session game (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) man that's I feel like that's that's such that's so I mean like I, I, I agree I see what uh uh Mr. Mr. Fizzer says uh says I don't know many GMs who run modules in my sphere and I feel like that's that's been my experience as well. Like most of the people that I've played games with and run games for, like it's it's almost always been homebrew. Um, except for that one time. Actually what's interesting here is that we have a cup I think only of all of us, probably only Remy you're probably the only one who's actually run like yeah. <laughs> or, like a pre-written module cuz like I know Freeman and I have de- and and Caitlin have all played them. We've played part in, in pre-written modules, but I don't think I've ever run one. So, I mean, what do you what I mean, what's your in your opinion like what what do you see as like kind of the biggest like difference for you personally? Like what makes oh. the biggest difference between the two? That's, I like, I do, because I do have, like, I am, like, currently running Storm King's Thunder, which is the, like, Mm. with that Caitlyn is in. Uh, But it's, like, my, even, like, my original, my first uh, campaign that I ran that I'm still DMing is a homebrew, but it's still based on the Forgotten Realm setting. Okay. And that, like, but I, like, I took, it's a lot of, like, I took the core setting bits and then rewrote a lot of them to make my own story for like the elements that I thought int- were interesting, specifically the Underdark. Like I completely rewrote the Underdark, mm. but mm. I still have the Out of Abyss campaign book if I ever want to run that too, because <laughs> I just really like the Underdark and whether I'm using like my own materials or like the pre-written stuff, I think a lot of it comes down to setting kind of stuff. Yeah, That's like, usually the hardest thing because I was even thinking like man I want to run my own fully homebrewed universe and then I sat down and I couldn't because it's really hard to write a setting (sighs) yeah but they like the thing that like I ran through like a bunch of reviews of uh 
like the pre-written uh D campaign books and trying to figure out which one i wanted to like run because writing a setting is hard also writing a campaign is hard but the there's like a lot of them that are like i think like baldur's gate was one that i was really thinking about but Baldur's Gate is a city in uh, the Forgotten Realms setting, and you basically stay there for the majority of that, like, module, versus, like, the Storm King's Thunder, which is, uh, uses basically the entire, like, Sword Coast region as its setting. So it felt a lot more interesting to explore uh, that, the, the the, the totality of what the Forgotten Realm setting can offer in a module versus just like those single ones take place in the right. single setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, I think that's, in, this is a, an important distinction to make, which uh, you kind of, you kind of point, put your finger on there, which is the difference between like pre-written content as in like a setting guide and then pre-written content as in like an actual campaign, like a, like a storyline. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's an important distinction to make when, when we're talking about this too, because like, that's like f- what Freeman and I have played. We've played Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. Tomb of Annihilation is a campaign. It's like a pre-written campaign. And frankly, I am of the opinion, as anybody who has watched <laughs> Ramblemancy for any period of time will know, uh, I am of the opinion that that should have been a setting guide rather than a campaign. But like, a, but that's just me. I mean, about that, about about Tomb of Annihilation. If you were to just follow the the the, the campaign, the story, you would never get to the cool world parts, the yeah. world building parts that are in that book. Because well, they put you on a, on like a timetable. It's a timetable. They put you on a timetable, and they don't. At, at no point is that explained to you. Like you know that you're on limited, like you are on borrowed time, but like you don't know how much time ever. So you don't know how much you, you how, how much you can interact with and how much you can't and explore so but then they also put a lot of really interesting stuff in there so i do i am fascinated by the concept remy of uh of storm king's thunder for exactly that purpose like because it seems to me like one that's a little bit less reliant on uh on sort of pushing players through the campaign at breakneck speed and a little bit more on getting to actually see what's in the world is yeah. that is that and accurate th- or yeah then like I think the Storm, Storm King's Thunder, at least, was, like, the first book that I came across that was a lot more, like, like quest-based rather than, like, campaign-based, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of what makes it really attractive for, like, running because, like, I basically, like, I have story beats that I will need to hit eventually, but every single little town is like a kind of setting guide that it has like stuff that can happen, things that can go wrong. And then there's like notable characters that will help drive the, the characters to those specific settings to deal with those specific problems. They'll get more quests. They'll maybe encounter the big, like uh, the big note of that campaign is it's about giants, Mm -hmm. but I think it's more about, you're not playing like giant characters in it. You're playing small folk that are dealing with a giant threat. So it's a lot about dealing with individual communities ravaged by giants and how you, there's like a lot of routes that you can take to reach the conclusion. There's literally, it's not not a spoiler, but there are five different chapters to get to the end goal. And each of those, you could you could run each of those chapters or just do one and then go to the end. Oh, wow. Like, there is a lot that you could do, but it's a lot about, again, the setting and having a place that, like, things will happen here, but it's not, and it can connect to the larger story, but it's about that individual, like, kind of quest. <laughs> That's. I really know when cool. before we started, you talked about, like, going in and there were things that you were specifically changing, like... How much do you like? How much of that do you feel like you've had to do with it, or is it just like you're just ready to? Because I know there, I know we talked about there was a little bit, and you wanted we did like the the player safety guides and stuff like that. But is it still pretty much like, or have you cut like large chunks out? I don't even know. So, for at least the stuff that I have specifically planned, like it's not that I cut stuff out; it's just that things were rewritten and re-written. changed. Yeah, because mm-hmm. a thing that I love D and D, I love the Forgotten Realm setting. I hate the racism that's written into mm-hmm. basically every corner of it. So I rewrote 
entire like race dynamics and like tensions between cultures and communities in order to make those feel less bad when actually like playing them and running them. But the kind of core of those events and like, while the reasons that they may have happened are different, they still happen. Yeah. Right. I couldn't remember what you had said, but I remember you were saying that you were changing some things because some things were like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that, that makes sense that like, it was that. It makes a lot of sense. That, yeah. <laughs> it, and that, I feel like that like becomes, that was like my huge hanging point when like deciding if I wanted to run like a pre-written module campaign, like do I want to deal with having to go through and vet some of these items versus, but then it's still like, it's still a really good setting and has interesting stories that can come along with it but weighing the work of writing my home my own setting <laughs> or just rewriting what the setting is there so <laughs> that that brings me to something i was i wanted to, was wanting to bring up earlier when caitlin when you were talking about like having taken like pieces of modules because uh i know that that's kind of been a major change from like earlier D D editions to like to 5e because in the past i'm not sure i I'm not entirely sure that third edition did this, but at least like at least um, in like AD and D and stuff like that, like second edition, <clears throat> um, they had like modules that were just like a dungeon, like and there was a storyline connected to that dungeon, but it was not intended for like a long period of time. It might have just been like one quest or something like that. Stuff that you could just take and plug and play into your own campaigns. Um, that's. That's something that I, I I wish that I had been like into D and D when that was kind of part of the uh, when that was kind of part of the main design because that's what I would love because everyone mm -hmm. like I have I the, the main difficulty that I think I would have with like pre written campaigns is that I would be sitting there going like all right this is what they want me to do but this I have my own ideas that I want to do mm -hmm. I know and I don't think I could do a module thing now yeah like. That's the thing that I think I would Maybe. struggle with. and But but the thing that I often need help with is when I'm just like, all right. Because one thing I'm really bad at, I'm very bad at dungeon design. I am <laughs> terrible at dungeon design. I would love to just take, uh, to just take, you know, like a, just have like a dungeon with, uh, even if there was like a storyline attached to it that you could either put it in there or just totally ignore and just have the, the physical like dungeon location. I would love that because that's like, that's the kind of content that is useful to me. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't think I'm making any specific point about that. I just, <laughs> just complaining. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Balancing a dungeon doesn't seem like it'd be very easy to make it like not so meat grindery, but like, I've watched a lot of Indiana Jones and I just want to like, if I were to make a dungeon, it'd probably be terrible for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think for me, the problem isn't balancing it in terms of being mm. easy or difficult uh, in terms of like combat, but it's, in, it's, it's difficult like to make it so that it's not just another generic room with like maybe a monster in it or maybe nothing in it. That's the part that's hard for me. <laughs> Also, I'm not an architect, so it's so like my dungeons will often make no sense if you think about them too hard. So that's it's not important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Remy. We're here, to have, we're here to have fun and make shit up. So like, you're doing great. <laughs> it's fantasy. Like you don't got to make it make sense. Yeah, yeah. It's so true. So true. If someone questions you on it, you just say, "You don't know. It just <laughs> is that way." And then they can they can think about it more than you can. Like, why is the library next to the larder? It's like, uh, it's why a not? mystery. Why yeah. not? I'd like my library close to the larder. Thank yeah, you no very kidding. much. I'd like to read books <laughs> and eat food yeah. simultaneously without I don't having want a long to trek across trip. an entire yeah. I don't want to go down two, two or three stories underground to get to my. Wait a minute! If this is, if this was like just somebody's, like a just a castle, why are there traps everywhere? Shut the fuck up! No, <laughs> just I like to keep. I like to stay on my toes. Okay. <laughs> well, you next you can go on a quest to find the architect. How's yeah. that sound? Get out of the dungeon library. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's the that's the side quest, or maybe it's a main quest. I don't know. That's perfect though. Yeah. <laughs> Look architect, architect ends up being the big you bad. You just threw and... acid out of your hands, and you want to know why? You want to understand arch the fine points of architecture? No. Uh, 
This is what I love about Ramble Man <laughs> It's my favorite thing to like being a DM. I think I only ended up having to do it once and it came from the loop. But like, mm. where someone was like, oh, like getting excited about the science of something. And they're like, wait, wait, so what does this mean? And I have to be like, the GM thought it would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, make an insight Don't check. Don't worry about it. <laughs> make an insight check. All right. Uh, you got a 15? All right, we're great. Um, you think from this that the GM thought it would be cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It means nothing. Congratulations, <laughs> you rolled high enough for me to reveal that it was totally thoughtless. <laughs> it's Normally the, it's it's the like fourth just... wall breaking roll. It's a roll yeah. for fourth mm-hmm. wall. Mm-hmm. It's nice. like the if you like if it was like a longer form campaign or a home campaign, like for specifically for it came from loop, like I probably would have like just let people like you know yeah you can have whatever theories you want about that but because I didn't want people to get hung up on it because we had like an episode left I was like don't worry about it <laughs> don't think about it ah <laughs> uh, yes <clears throat> um, you talk to the architect later <laughs> uh i i wanted to scroll up and go back to something i saw in chat hold on let me see if i can find it again um something that i thought was kind of thought was kind of interesting that rose said was just we have a homebrew mission that we've played enough times that it basically counts as a module now i'm very curious as to what you mean by that like you don't have to like break it down or anything like that but like is like when you say that you've played it a bunch of times you mean like the same scenario that you've played with different characters different times or like is different it players? Yeah, like, different players. Like I, I did that. I, I write a game and then play it with yeah. like twelve different groups. <laughs> yeah, I I did that during Halloween with two different oh, groups. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, sorry, Remy, what were you gonna say? That like brings up a good thing that like I remember that my roommate is currently running a Curse of Strahd game, mm-hmm. and you start that game out by doing a tarot reading that determines the entire campaign, Ooh, basically. Cool. So it can Ooh. there's a someone that's in that uh player group that he's run it before but like my roommate drew entirely different cards so he has no clue what like the rest of the campaign is going to be like and yeah. i guess it's like one of the like the module darlings of D right now everybody wants to play or run a mm-hmm. curse of Strahd game yeah burn wanted to run it for us like a while ago like when we first started playing in college and they were like yeah i wanted to run you guys through curse of Strahd next but we all graduated and <laughs> we never picked it back up again but yeah, I've not gotten a chance to play it, but everything I hear about it makes it sound wilder mm-hmm. and wilder. That's so cool. I did not know that about Chris Estrada. Yeah. I I think it's interesting because I also saw um, Mr. Fizzer said something earlier, which was, let me see if I find it. Uh, the only one uh, I ran had to be improv hack to save the party from dissolution, <laughs> which is great <laughs> because that, nice. like, here's the thing. If I... I have this I, I have this thing like I just one of the reasons why I suspect like I want to try try running like a pre-written campaign at some point but I suspect that if if me as a player in a pre-written campaign is anything to go by then me as a DM <laughs> then me as a DM would just like I would be the one taking us off the rails because that's <laughs> what I did as a player <laughs> At one point, and Freeman can, will confirm that at one point when our our, our DM was running uh, Tomb of Annihilation, <laughs> a choice that a choice that, I mean, we mostly made it together, but I instigated it, um, caused him to literally like close the book in front of us and throw it across the room. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. He's he was like, beautiful. "Well, we don't need this for a while." <laughs> He's like, yep. we'll this for the next few sessions." <laughs> it was really good. I love that. Was a good moment. <laughs> so. Uh, gosh, that's right. I forgot, Hessen, that you were in the Halloween game, one of the Halloween games, and Gemini's here too. Hello. Hey. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um. Okay. So Rose says, yeah, different players and just new characters. All told, we've probably played the mission like twenty times. It plays very differently depending on the party composition. That's oh, so course. cool. I love that. <laughs> that's that kind of stuff is fascinating to me, right? Like when when you have like a especially especially if it's homebrew <clears throat> right like the idea of, of write, writing out like a short adventure and then playing it with a different group which is mm-hmm. actually the halloween the halloween game that i played with two different groups was a sort of isolated section of our home game that was part of like a larger campaign but i just sort of like it was sort of a very self-contained section like i missed that section let's see what it would be like with new people who've never played it before and it was completely different. It was very, very different. Oh, Geek Outs is here too. Man, we have I have like three of the people who were in that in the in those games, right, just right here. Uh, I did that same exact thing too with my like first like DM game that like I wrote a like the first session was 
like basically a puzzle based scavenger hunt because I really like writing puzzles for like stuff mm. and whatever. Puzzle and hell? then like Yep, it's Puzzle, puzzle Hell. hell. Like yeah. <laughs> my module I effectually call Puzzle Hell. I've run like two or three other times now outside of it that just like takes away like the actual campaign stuff and then puts it into new things using the exact same puzzle so I can only run it like once with these people again but it's I've had incredibly different like ways that people like go through it like some people take like it's a puzzle game but like some people take like an espionage kind of route through it or just like brute force their way through things and it's incredibly interesting seeing how just different groups react to like the same idea and content yeah yeah because like that that's the thing like different people will have different um will have different interpretations of what's going on and so then they'll like have a different idea about what to do about a certain situation so that that's yeah i always love that um and additionally, I also see Rose said it's also it's a good way to bring new players into the system with a mission that other players are already familiar with. And I fully agree. That's that's also there's also something about having something very self-contained. Yeah, that is good for bringing new people in mm. like having something I <clears throat> there's a there's an adventure uh, for uh, uh, Monty Cook's uh, Stars Are Fire that I really want to run at some point. Like I've only like briefly glanced through it and it looks so cool. <laughs> I really want to do that at some point just cuz I love Cypher System and also The Stars Are Fire is just a very very excellent book. Um it's helped a lot with Infinite Horizon. <laughs> As we seen used in the it last the episode, episode. <laughs> like whole like a half an hour of the last ep- end of the last episode. Mm-hmm. It's fun. It's a gorgeous book too. Yeah, Geek Out says Mass Effect game, Mass Effect game, and Star Wars game. When Lucas, uh, you know, if you can, if you can, like somehow petition, uh, successfully petition to have additional days added to the week. Um, <laughs> I Not. yeah, then then we'll see. Um, <laughs> no, hey, but hey, there's a there's a fun side hustle you could do. You could just start see if you, like sell sell games, get people to come in and play at your table. <laughs> yeah. I you <laughs> I I was it's this is totally not related to anything, but but I was actually approached at one point, uh, sort of end of last year ish, about like somebody wanting to hire me to oh, run I games. Oh, I remember this. Yeah, it didn't bear out because I like Uh-oh. when I was. Like, I was super busy when they first reached out, and then even busier when they reached out a second time. And then when I finally, like, had time, we, like, connected once and then never talked again. So, like... Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Such is the way. Yeah. Um, but... In the, like, the... In, yeah. like, a... Oh, sorry, what were you saying? No, no, I was gonna... I was gonna... Geek Out's thing, uh, comment about Mass Effect and Star Wars had a different... At, uh, gave me a, a thought about a different topic but continue what were you gonna say i was gonna say in like a weird cross section between homebrew and modules um probably one of the most the most flattered i've probably ever been as someone who runs games was i wrote a big one shot for uh, a friend and some of her friends and her fiance and we i hadn't met at, I knew my friend. We've known each other since we were children, but I only kind of knew her fiance and I only kind of knew, I did not know their friends at all. And they came in and were like, I was like, I'm like, yeah, I'd run a game for you guys. And we had never been able to play a game together. Hell yeah, I'll bring stuff in. I'll bring it over. And I wrote this huge game store like all day. I was like, all right, let's do it. It ended up being nine hours, but I ran this game for these guys, a bunch of strangers. And one of the guys reached out to me afterwards and he was like, okay, I just need you to know that was like the coolest thing I've ever played. And I was wondering if you, if like you would be cool if, I could run it for my <laughs> home game. And I was like, what? He was oh. like, it's okay if you don't have like the notes from like, no, I have pretty intense notes. <laughs> oh, right. Hi, I'm sorry. We haven't met. I'm Caitlin Bruder. <laughs> I'm Caitlin Bruder. Yeah. <laughs> I had never met this guy before we played and he like asked for my, my notes for that game. He ran it three times and oh he texts me about it every time he runs it. And so I've never been more flattered before. So a homebrew thing that I made became a module for that's someone else. Incredible. That's incredible. So cool. But you that ended know. up spurring a, a one shot group. We met. We used to meet once a month, and everyone, someone else would bring a one shot to mm-hmm. play. But yeah, be, 
probably the coolest shit that <laughs> the coolest compliment anyone's ever played me. But yeah, runs up, runs it every once in a while and will text me about it and be like, hey, ran your ran your Citadel game again. And I was like, oh, holy shit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I so the 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 thing that I was thinking um earlier and then geek out's uh comment actually reminded me of of it was the the idea of running this is something that comes up every once in a while that we talk about very very briefly but have any of you run or played in freeman i know the answer when when it for you but well i've only ever been the player so well i mean (laughs) Yeah, and and most of that time is with me, so I know most of what you've played. <laughs> you know it all. <laughs> but but um, have any of you? What are your thoughts on running or playing in uh s- like existing settings like Star Trek, Mass Effect, um, Star Wars, like those kinds of things? Have you done any of that? Have like what are your thoughts on it? I don't think I ever have. Like in in existing. Mm-hmm. like ip yeah i don't know if i've ever i don't know if i ever have like i watch a lot of people who do but yeah. i don't we all I'm the only i'm getting tripped up because we almost played Star Trek. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think i have yeah it'd it's be fun like, but <laughs> i want to say before we go get into it mm-hmm. is if i think if i had played cypher first i would have come into star trek adventure with a different yeah a whole different like mindset into pl- how to play I was like fresh out of D and D, so it was kind of that one of those transitions. That was a little bit of a, yeah, not rough, but it was just, it's a different way of playing. It I think if I'd done Cipher first, no, now I think I could play a Star Trek adventure yeah, game. It definitely and be is a, way into it. Definitely requires a huge like frame shift. Like, yeah, I think like the like setting literacy and like. That's not like the right word. What am mm-hmm. I trying to say? That like, like tr- the tropes of like any kind of like setting kind of like need to be like known and established. And I I was like thinking about this a while ago on like why dwarves are all like short bearded people when they live underground and would be potentially more towards like heat sources and live closer to the center of the earth. They wouldn't need body hair. They like physically they really wouldn't but then like elves are like really like spindly tall hairless people that live out in the will the wilderness and the forest they would need body hair Mm -hmm. to live out in those settings and but like we have these established tropes because they're like easy to like get into and like create so like everybody knows what a star trek and a star wars and like mass effect are i said that really weird that's perfect it's good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we know what those there. are <laughs> and so like it we a lot of us already have literacy into like the kind of tropes that are established with those things so i think that like it helps to know like it, in those pre-written settings it helps to know those things going in because like if you're learning a new system like you don't know how to necessarily interact with certain like class or racial benefits if you you're not really familiar with those classes or races yeah but like yeah. you get it and you see them in star wars and see them on star trek you know how these people act and like what their kind of species are like so it's easier to do i guess yeah yeah i also i also think that there's something to be said about at least for me the difficulty of running uh running star trek adventures was the fact that like I had very, at the time when I was running it, uh, I had very little, um, very little real knowledge of Star Trek. So it was harder for me to run, um, the, like, our, our game with, like, the game that Freeman and I are in, it was harder for me to run a Star Trek game in that because I, like, really had not very much knowledge at that time. And then contrasting that, because then later with a different group, I ran Star Trek Adventures for a little while. And that was that I was able by then I had more context and I was able to run like a much more a game that felt like Star Trek um, to the point where like where it was even sort of structured very much like an episode of Star Trek is structured. So I don't know. I think I think a certain amount of um, like you don't have to know Star Trek in order to enjoy playing star trek adventures like you don't have to be super super into star trek and like know the granular detail or anything like that 
but it helps. <laughs> yes. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I think that's kind of my main thing with with running in existing IPs is that ev- is that to some degree everybody at the table has to have some knowledge or understanding of that setting or else you end up with situations where people are like, oh, "Okay, well, I don't know what to do." And yeah. yeah, Mr. Fizzer in chat says the imbalance that can occur when a player has an encyclopedic knowledge and a GM doesn't is awkward. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I guess that like that helps with like home. Maybe it can be a benefit and a and a detractment when like using homebrew settings in like games and stuff because you you are like maybe coming up with like the the roles and classes and like species of that setting and so you can you can have like your players help build out those like things with you right. but then like someone else that maybe wasn't in on that building process like is maybe going to struggle a little bit more with like knowing what these kind of people are like if like they're they they're maybe like a more worldly they're playing a more worldly character they sh- maybe should know uh but then you can have a hash session of just like <laughs> we're talking about like what's going on with these people in game i guess i mean coming into infinite horizon i feel like i definitely had a different like from the rest of the players <laughs> like as we've talked about before like i i was helping write the infinite horizon setting before we knew i was going to be a player so like I had a lot more intimate knowledge of our homebrew setting than the other players did for a while. <laughs> and like, so like I jumped in, I was like, yeah, let's do it. But I don't know, like I, Freeman, like, I, Freeman, I can ask you, like, was it weird jumping into a homebrew setting that you didn't help like create or you just ripper on ready to go? <laughs> I was ready to go. Like that's the oh, only yeah. thing I know about like playing tabletop role playing games is like, is just like different pieces of content like put together. Yeah. but using like a system to like hold it together the mm-hmm. stitching like the dungeons and dragons we, yeah. <laughs> vessel of course mm-hmm. so i was i was like oh yeah this is like <clears throat> this is home this is home <laughs> yeah and in, honestly in some ways having a homebrew setting like Re- like remy was saying it do- is easier for that reason because mm-hmm. all you have to do is like take your knowledge of like just existing tropes story beats like pieces of things that exist in the types of in the types of game like genre that you're playing in and just stitch them together in your brain and then you can mm-hmm. make certain assumptions about it based on that um which is and cool. that's how we get the opening uh like prologue episodes of infinite horizon where each one of them was a different <laughs> genre oh i love that and we brought them to- it was amazing oh yeah. it makes me so happy every time mm-hmm. i think about it <laughs> yeah oh, gosh i was thinking about those actually uh a few days ago because i was like messing around with uh with some of like the the settings on on youtube and on and on the the podcast and i was so and i like was looking at them i was like man i remember those and just thinking about how cool it was that each each one of those was totally different in like its genre in tone in everything about it it was just so cool so fun so but. when when's Remy gonna come on? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that right now. We're live on the internet. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just want Remy to come hang out all the time. <laughs> I would be happy too. Yeah. Um. Oh, this is actually also a good point. Um, that Geek Outs brought up, which is um when you're streaming content it helps if you own the content 100 percent. that way it's yours and no one can yeah. pull the plug also mm-hmm. since the major studios don't want to take a risk on an original ip um yeah i yeah very true that's that's very true it's one of the reasons why as much as i love the idea of running a star wars game and i have one as you know geek outs because we've talked about it um i have one that i really want to do at some point I will probably never stream it be- for exactly that reason because the mouse is vicious and <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah we uh yeah I just uh wouldn't want to wouldn't want to risk it so yeah it really does suck but yeah no I could totally run a home game of it but the game that I want to run is uh 
it's it's sort of a long term sort of thing, and I do not have the time for that. <laughs> I cannot add another long term campaign to my, especially since we there's like we're we've been on hiatus from our from our home from our home game, that like, I but I still keep it as like keep the place in mind where I'm like yeah. I yeah. cannot add another game because of that one like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh no, for sure. <laughs> Even though it's not actually happening right now, but no, but it's it's there though in, yeah. in spirit, you know. It's yeah. like I'm holding that there in case like it comes up, I'm ready to jump right back on it. Yeah. So actually, so speaking of our of our home game, one of the things that I was thinking about was, um, like, uh, it started out in Pathfinder. We like we started out playing Pathfinder, <laughs> and then eventually converted to Five E. And one of the things that I think is interesting about Pathfinder as opposed to D and D, is that Pathfinder has its own setting, and that setting is Golarion, like the world of Golarion. And it only has, as far as I'm aware, it only has that one setting. Whereas D&D, there are many settings. Like, I mean, officially they have the Forgotten Realms, and that's kind of like their their official uh, setting. But you, you've also got official content that has come out for Eberron and for um, for other other. I'm trying to remember which other ones I know that, that they have. I don't have Avernus. That's the only module of anything I've ever bought. Right, but I it don't is know still, what that's attached that to. That is still Forgotten Realms, I believe. It is, Because okay. I think you start out in Baldur's Gate. Yes, you do. So, yeah. yeah. So that's still Forgotten Realms. Um, but one of the things I think about that is that is that my... Yeah, no, it has a nice... I know that they have Greyhawk and that sort of... But do they have that for 5e yet? Do they have, like, a Greyhawk stuff for 5e or... Um, I've seen, yeah. Hmm. Um. But anyway, like that's one of the things that I that I. Xandria. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's fair. Uh, that's true. That is that is now official because they like Wizards published one. Yeah. Um. But that's a, that that's an interesting thing, right? Because that affects very much how the lore is presented, right? Because, um, you you have the monster manual for D anD D. But the monsters in it, like, it gives you a little bit of lore, but it doesn't, doesn't go into depth because it can't. Because the monster has to be able to fit into the campaign setting, uh, and that campaign setting might not be the Forgotten Realms. So it's kind of, it from to me, it often feels very sort of dry of details or anything that... Whereas I remember playing playing Pathfinder, some of my best ideas came from like reading into the lore of cer- certain monsters and like, ooh, that's cool. I have an idea for like a plot hook, right? And I just don't feel that way with with D anD D. Like I haven't felt that way with Five E. I definitely agree on that. And like that was like my big surprise when like actually like getting into reading these campaign books is that for all that I love about D anD D, they are kind of very like the warrior's path, like moving through a. Uh, setting in like a situation and there's obvious there's it still presents like other options too but it like it is even with like uh being in a canon setting like it's still very dry of details and i'm like i can describe things but i have to like fill it in more it's like i've been presented the outline but i have to paint the picture in Mm -hmm. sort of thing right and that's and that's the thing like i i appreciate like i think there's a certain amount of uh, of having things that are like preset in a way that that is like that gives a lot of depth to them because kind of like but it's kind of counterintuitive in the way that it works right like you'd think you'd think that the more detail there is the more in depth the lore goes the more likely you would feel married to those things and like the need to use them in the exact way that they are presented and it feels almost like it would be more restricting but I actually have felt the opposite, right? Like the fewer details there are in there, like the less compelling it is and the less able I am to come up with something cool. Like I found with Pathfinder, I was able to like read some of the lore and be like, that's cool, that's ridiculous, and I'm going to cut that out of it, but I like this part of it, right? And it was much easier for me to do that when there was more depth than without it. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Like for my, like I said, my my underdark game. I basically, I basically wrote that because I wanted to make a puzzle game, but also just 
put as many underdark like aberrant monsters in it as I could it's literally just chalked to the brim full of as many as I can put in but like <laughs> I rewrote all of them <laughs> also mm -hmm. and used that like mm -hmm. kind of those like dry descriptions of like oh this thing is super evil and it will kill you on sight and I'm like that's not fun I'm gonna <laughs> rewrite it so it's this one is this one will be a major character and it's in the Ferrum, the giant sunflower monster mm -hmm. in my game oh, yeah. it's a opera singer she is a, a world-renowned <laughs> opera singer in the underdark i love so that cool. i remember and, you sitting and talking to me about all of like you walked me through the whole that whole campaign and like your plot hooks and things that were coming in the future and i was like this is <laughs> there's so much happening i love this so I, every, every time you talk about everything you've done with that campaign i'm just like tell me like tell me more i mean <laughs> and it's that's like like i love the underdark but it's like suffers from that like kind of the racist stuff is in there and like also like weird sexist stuff that because it's a matriarchy and they'll demonize a matriarchy because it's not our society sort of thing but beyond that like it i find it as like a place of like a jumping off point to like i can this is an idea i can rewrite it and resituate everything within it like when I was talking about Storm King's Thunder earlier, like the situation remains the same that the players have to deal with, but the reason why they're there and what choices a NPC made to become the antagonist of a certain situation, that's been completely rewritten and reformatted for how I want the this new version of this scene to be presented. Yeah, yeah. Um... So I, I wanted to jump to chat real quick because um, I saw Mr. Fizzer was pointing out um, Numenera, which is which is an existing setting that I've actually never for the cipher system. Uh, in fact, I think mm. the cipher system was derived from <clears throat> Numenera. Um, like mm -hmm. Numenera came first, I think, and then they were just like, "What if we just separated the like took." and removed all of the setting specific stuff Ag make it agnostic <laughs> make it, system yeah. and setting agnostic yeah, yeah. Which, so cool uh is excellent um but uh mr fisher says those points of inspiration uh are another thing i love about numenera the books are just full of rumors that intend uh oops, that intend for you to expand on them i think you feel more invested when the book book asks questions and you provide the answers yeah. that is very cool i think that that is a useful way of designing pre-written content um where the where there it's like got almost it doesn't give you the answers but it guides you to the answers which i think is really a cool way of of doing anything like some of my favorite uh third party content that i've ever found for any game um has been uh m it's been like content that's been created specifically that asks questions like one of them that i found is a character hot seat that basically oh, asks fun. you like a bunch of questions, like yes or no questions about your character um, based. And like, there's different like question sets depending on the type of character that you're making. Like if it's a mage or a warrior or something like that. And it asks you a bunch of different questions about your character. And then you can answer yes or no, of course. But the rule is that you have to add a detail regardless of what you answer. So like it can say, uh, did you grow up in the city? And you can say yes. And when I lived there, I was an urchin in the streets. Or like, or you can say no. But I, my family went to market there every weekend or something like that. Right? Like that. Mm -hmm. You could do that kind of stuff as like, as a thing. And I think that's super useful because, and I think Rose kind of follows up on this because Rose said the fanfic approach. It's a lot easier to hack up the lore than invent it wholesale. And I absolutely agree. Yeah. And that's why I think the question approach works so well, right? Because you you are given something that starts your brain going, and you're like, and so like you can say, oh yes, I like that, or you can say no, but it gives <laughs> me a jumping off point, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think that's that's very very cool. I love in a system that specifically like before you set up a campaign that it, if it has preset stuff whether it's you're going into the world or you're going into like actual story modules like where it starts out with like letting the players influence the world like i know i, I think it's kids on bikes they have a they have a, a rumor system like where like everyone has yeah. to you have to what's your connection to this character what do you think about them is it true like and you have to like come up with things that you think you know about the world and whether or not they become true is up to like 
the GM or with other players or whatever. And like, I think that's so cool. And that's something that anytime I run anything that's more than just like a, we're just in a city and you guys are running around and it's not, this the setting isn't important. It's the, what you're trying to do. But like, like, a, I, that was what, that's one of my favorite things is making the players or I guess having the players help me build out the world. Like it came from the loop. I almost every single NPC was made by my players. Like, I don't know if y'all, you all didn't really go out of your pre-established connections, which was really cool. Like I was expecting to have to like come up with more people on the fly, but not really like it. And that's really cool. And like a lot of the places you went were all places that y'all made exist in the world, which is also so cool to me. Like, Ugh, I love that. I love I love being able to like take something that is this is a setting that exists, but there's a lot of these blank canvases that exist around it that you can fill in like as needed and like filling in about the world and letting the characters' opinions influence the world. I think that's so cool. I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um here's uh here's a question I think is probably worth tackling, which is of um of pre-written stuff like what do you personally find most useful from like pre-written things because like i mentioned before like for me a thing that i would find most useful dungeons i would love i love more pre-designed dungeons but like for for the rest of you what are things that both from like a from like a gm standpoint and also from like a player standpoint either way what are the things that you would find most useful i think maybe for me like characters because like i like i like more like character driven narratives whether that be like the players being the characters or the npcs being certain characters in certain situations but like in pre-written stuff you'll usually just be presented with like a here's a stock guard guy named jerry and you can deal with him however you want and some and whenever I like run games because you've named this guy Jerry, like everyone will fixate on Jerry, and it doesn't matter how important Jerry actually is to anything. People will will like like this person because he is he's been written in. He has a identity and not just door guard. Mm-hmm. He's on purpose. And, <laughs> yeah, it's on purpose. But that it and now people have like more of like both me as like a DM and like as like a player, I have a connection to this space because I know that guy, I know he's Jerry and I know what he does. And I can imagine like as a player or a DM, imagine what the heck Jerry does and with his whole day. <laughs> and that beyond just like the setting, like obviously there's how we interact with the setting and all of that. But I think like, I like character driven narratives. So focusing in on who occupies a space is really good for me. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point for sure. That's a good one. Uh, others? Gosh, I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different things, I suppose. Definitely like characters, settings. Mm-hmm. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Hessen actually has a really good one, which is pre-built factions are good. And I agree. That's a good point. Factions like... are good. Yeah, that's that's one that's useful for like GMs and players alike, because then like if players want to incorporate something like that into their backstory, they can't like I know on In Too Deep, um, several of the characters several of the players uh made their characters tied to a faction that exists in Waterdeep, and i think that's really cool like so, some of their backstory is like directly tied into the factions that were pre-made and i think that's really interesting because basically what you're doing at that point is you're taking as a player you're taking something that's pre-written and making it your own because without fully without like altering the reality of what was written before because you're just basically using it to inform your story mm-hmm. which i think is a really cool thing like this kind of goes back to what we were talking about like rose put it the the, the fanfic approach right yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm like i'm gonna just gonna keep referencing it came from a loop because mm-hmm. that's the most recent yeah. and most fleshed out game i think i've run within the past like five years but um i really liked 
I maybe there was more and I just ignored it, but like the it came from the loop. Sorry, that's the name of the show. The Tales from the Loop <laughs> book is really cool because it has like enough of a setting. And like it does have modules, like I had said before, but it's very much like I have context and now I get to build something within it. And there's like enough blank spaces that I got to fill it in. Like I was saying, like having my players give me, what's your kid's favorite location in town? That exists now in world. Whether you go there or not, I don't know, but it it's, exists and it's an anchor and it makes this place feel real and level. But the, the having a map, I love that. I love having like <laughs> a map that's pre-made that isn't just like a continent, like where we had Boulder City and I had like, I had the streets. Like I could take you guys if I wanted to take you exactly where you were trying to go and like, that was really cool. And then having the some societal context in the town of the loop, like right. here are things we feel and believe in this town and things that are normal. Here is the town itself. And he, it, it's predetermined that X, Y, Z, in this case, weird things happen here. Like, and that was like having those pieces and getting to like push a story through it was really fun. So I think that kind of a thing is, is really helpful where it's not fully homebrewed, but it's not a full concrete setting either because so you get to kind of like add into it what you see. So I think, yeah, like having a skeleton of a setting, yeah, I, I, that's always really helpful for me. Maps too. <laughs> maps for sure. <laughs> I was going to say like that, that I can resonate with that maps for sure. I, because we, for our home game, we, we, Lucas, you and I, we made a map mm -hmm. for one of the cities. That's right. That's, that's the first map that I think was ever made for that campaign. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then with it, yeah. And it was just done with pencil and paper. Yeah. And uh, within the city, there were, there were um, the names of the shops. And that brings me to my other favorite thing is having like locations, the names of locations, like s stores for you get your potions, supplies, where you get a drink, whatever. I love that so much. So maps and then like cities and locations on the map. I'm really obsessed with maps. I, 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 like every time I go and read Lord of the Rings, the first thing I do is I look at the map yep. and I'd spend so many minutes just looking at the, at the Tolkien map of the, of the Middle Earth. See, before that's, I read. A, that's a good point because yeah. of the visual aids. I think you don't yeah. have to make anything if like you just get it's it in there. like your little book. It's <laughs> yep. there and you don't have to like sketch everything out just yourself like having both for dm and for player reference mm -hmm. like it helps you see the world regardless of what that is yeah i would like to say um remy did draw every major npc in our <laughs> campaign that we're doing right now <laughs> they're awesome it's we'll very say cool. there's, there's over 200 named npcs i'm up to 95 portraits out of all oh, of them yeah. now they're all and very cool <laughs> we're, vol we're so only much. Yeah, we're we're barely in it. We're in chapter I, one still. I know. Wow, <laughs> that's cool. So it's amazing. And that's like I say, I like characters. I like that's your visual aid, your anchor into this world. Mm -hmm. This person lives here. They exist here. You can do. You can interact with them to know the space. Makes them real. It makes you mm -hmm. feel like you have a place in yeah in the setting. It's cool. Yeah. Actually, I, that's that's very interesting. I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that be, because the the idea of maps because. I'm thinking back now to our playing Tomb of Annihilation and during the part of the game that I enjoyed, which was exploring the jungle, yep. um, that part, that was, the, I, the map was useful uh, because at a certain point, like after, after, you know, for a while we had to just like keep referencing the map and keep going like, okay, where are things in relation to each other? But after a while it got to a point where like, I didn't even have to, I didn't even have to like, Th like look at the map i just like knew vaguely where stuff was where i'm like okay so port nanzaru is like up there it's kind of mm -hmm. like north ish and then so that the dragons like the the, dra the dragon's lair is is west of that kind of northwest ish of that maybe southwest ish of that and like yeah and so like i was able to just sort of like kind of visualize after a while roughly like rough geog geography of the place that we were and that that like i understand that i'm basically explaining what a map is for but my point is that it made it possible <laughs> I mean, for me to actually like visualize it in a way that i wouldn't have been able to without that specific visual aid yeah or else it's just an amorphous like exactly of places yeah. like we mm -hmm. went here but like where is that in relation to the last place we went hey. or a three days horse ride what that doesn't mean anything to me exactly yeah. i don't i can't see anything i don't know anything is yeah that type of visual aid is like 
another thing that's super helpful to like anchor and ground mm-hmm. you in in world. Mm-hmm. And remind me if I'm incorrect, this was a map that we would not see the map. Yeah. We would see it as we discovered the locations and then that part of the map would be unlocked visually. Yeah. If I'm not the, mistaken. Yeah, because there's which I love. There, I think there are several versions of the. I haven't really looked at, at it myself at Tomb of Annihilation. Even though I bar, after we finished that campaign, I did borrow the book from my friend who who ran who ran it. Uh, but I haven't really looked at the map very extensively. But I believe there are a couple of different versions of the map. Um, there's like the the original player one that has like most of the most of it is like. Uh, it's it's a hex map, but most of it is is covered over. It's blank, mm-hmm. uh, blank hexes, and then there's the GM map that has uh, that's completely revealed, and then I think there are some intermediary maps where I don't think we got these in our game, but I think there are some maps in the middle that like uh, have sections more sections revealed, but I'm mm-hmm. not one hundred percent sure if that's true. But at least the first two, I know that there's those two types. Those two. That's what I thought, yeah. So cool. It's like, uh, I have no idea. There's no map for this place. We're discovering it uh, right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. There is, there is a certain strange satisfaction to, uh, to the exploration part of that where you're like, all right, we got to make sure that we've got – like, I know I've said this before, and some people have been like, that sounds like – hell to me but i enjoy right. the, or- the oregon trail aspect of it yeah where you're just like we're like all right we've got to make sure that we've got enough rations for our for our for our thing under there but we got to make sure that we that we balance how much we can carry with how much we're going to need for a certain amount of expedition we also need to keep track of all of our bug repellent because we don't want to get diseases out and like there's yeah, something weirdly satisfying to, to me about that. and i know it that was there are some people who would find that hellish but <laughs> no that was I love that too. I love it's also that too. like I I'm someone I'm a very visual person. Most people mm-hmm. who know me know this about me. Like I like to be able to see things and like because I I have no real I don't ha- I don't have very good spatial reasoning. So maps are always very very helpful. But there is also something very satisfying about like playing in a full theater of the mind game where like. <laughs> in a situation in which like the DM is like, well, roll to see if you remember how you did this before, and you can be like. Oh, Oh, okay. Well, I was just gonna say we go through this door. We went through this door. I was down the hallway, whatever. Like you still remember that? I think I did that in our suburb D and D game, Remy, with yeah. like we were trying to get back to like a library and we hadn't been there in a while. But I remembered how to get there. But I was like, oh, I won't make you roll then because you you just remembered. Yeah, yeah. yeah you remember the, the reverse directions like exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so that's also really fun. But God, I, maps are my maps are much nicer on my brain. But I do feel very powerful when I can remember things. <laughs> <laughs> that a gym was gonna make me roll for <laughs> or like discovery like burn who made the entire cipher for us to try to like unlock in in world and try to read this old um arcane not arcane like ancient uh dead language since but in real world we could actually decide like decode it and decipher it as like yeah. that was really fun like having in those extra pieces um like yeah. in world but are actually us out of world can also you know, manipulate and handle and figure out on our own. That was always really fun. It's been a while since I've tried to read it, but I could very slowly read things in it for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hessen says, Lucas, the quartermaster, listen, I did not track any of our supplies. That was somebody else's job. I just helped figure out how much we needed. <laughs> yeah. To there and back. Yeah. And also, they, I was also in charge of self-appointed uh person in charge of figuring out how we were funding our shit so that was also another fun part was like how are we going to get the supplies well we're going to have to do these odd jobs here and there we're gonna have to run this gauntlet and win some money in a bet or (laughs) there's something very equally satisfying about being a fighter who has a really high athletic skill running the the gauntlet uh of like trying to basically outrun a bunch of velociraptors that's also fun um for money so that i could uh so i could you know we could buy in my mind those characters are still alive (laughs) and they are on that island and they're doing good work yeah they haven't even gone if anybody if anybody is running uh, if anybody's running uh like level uh nine ten ish D D game 
I have an Eldritch Knight that died tragically in in the Tomb of Annihilation that I would love to bring to your game. <laughs> yeah, I've got a what is it? I have a uh, a war cleric, mm-hmm. and I also have a a uh, sniper sniper warlock. Yeah, <laughs> who's like, you know what? I don't care if you're like half or three quarters cover. I still get you for five from five hundred feet away with my oh, Eldritch way more than that. Like I think we when we did the math, it was like close to a quarter mile that you could get people. With your... Yeah, no, there's just no way the fucking warlock sniper. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah. Yeah, we we, we I was yeah we did, I knew I had did, to I had to make a super yeah. boss character for this we game. We did some after. of the math on that one, and at some point, just out of curiosity, and we figured it was pretty. It was just under a quarter mile that Freeman's warlock could snipe some dude while ignoring three quarters cover. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yep, good yeah. times. <laughs> Um, what was his name? I know it's it's not part of the, but it's like a monosyllabic name. Was the, boar. Boar, was, right, was, boar. The, was the warlock. Um, yep, boar. Boar. And then there was hey. that, yeah. And there was thanks Mike. for saving me. <laughs> no, you found me like they. All, I escaped. Well, <laughs> yeah, I escaped okay, so, from a pirate no, ship. This, that's no, no, no. This is this is good because so like this is interesting because yeah. uh, because in Tomb of Annihilation when we were playing it, it starts out with like. I think by default with everybody arriving in like the party arriving in Port Nanzaru on the Isle of Cholt. But our, our DM actually decided that he wanted to homebrew in like a sort of prequel at the beginning where we were actually playing. um, We were playing. I think I don't, I think he basically like heavily modified a small portion of the starting adventure. Um, Minds of yeah. Fandelver, the Lost Minds of Fandelver. Um, he he took a small part of that, heavily modified it, and that was sort of our um, our prequel into the game. And he basically did so. He basically what he did was he did the setup for Tomb of Annihilation that normally you just get dropped into and get uh, like uh, exposition dumped later after you started. He just did the we, he just let us play through the expedi- exposition part, mm-hmm. which I thought was kind of interesting. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I know you've talked about that yeah. before, but that's that's really neat to me. Yeah, <laughs> which I think is like the reverse of how I tend to use pre-written content, because he took a pre-written module and homebrewed in like little bits of it. Me, I would take mm-hmm. a homebrew thing, like a homebrew a homebrew campaign, and like toss in some grafted-on pieces of existing pre-written stuff. But yeah, I think that's yeah. like my idea. Like, is a healthy combo of homebrew and in like pre-written or like module based stuff like because i feel like i always am like well i want to like change i want to make this different but also i want to use the rest of your skeleton like <laughs> i think that's for for me personally that's like i think more my happy ha- happy spot is my is like taking something that exists someone else wrote and then like i frankenstein it <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's where i exist well, i think like especially like the things that i have like in Storm King Slender, for example, like the things that I I have homebrewed stuff existing in for that that I've written already, but we're obviously not there yet. But like that setting allows me to explore a lot of like the character's own personal quests and goals, and br- like expand out like the ideas of these certain settings as is. Like it doesn't have to just be a one stop town that you see and forget. This might be where someone's backstory entirely takes place or something Mm -hmm. like that is the fun potential of some of these like module based uh campaigns yeah absolutely (laughs) and that's the ability to play-doh crush it into the shape you want is always fun (laughs) yeah well and i think that that's like ultimately that like that is probably one of the most useful things about pre-written content is that it like at least for me anyway it just gives me a jump start for my ideas right like i don't i don't ever feel pressured to use the things that are written like to the letter um because that's largely against my entire personality um but yeah like that, that i think that that's one of the best things about those is that it serves as a certain amount of inspiration as well as providing you with like with tools that you didn't have to make yourself that you would have had to otherwise. Um, 
Check out our tabletop tool chest. <laughs> this was not a plug for that, but it so very easily could have been. <laughs> if only I had made that statement at the end of the episode, then we then then we would have been in business. Uh, <laughs> no, it turns out this entire episode of Ramblemancy is just one elaborate plug for our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my goodness>. <laughs> <laughs> for, for some of our patreon content <laughs> oh gosh um i agree geek outs geek out says one of my favorite ways to modify something is how can i make this more gay yes um look at uh for for good examples of that you can look at in too deep our water deep dragon heist campaign on tuesdays at 4 p.m i'm gonna stop anyway <laughs> i would say anything that has been made so far on Rule of War, we kind of make it. That's true. We make it gay. We came up with a gay love story before the characters were even introduced in Infinite Horizon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We are like, There's, so these two will probably be in love, even though you haven't met who I'm talking about yet, and also we haven't started the show yet. But I'm, I was like, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Kane's Kayton, like, I'm in. Let's, let's go. I'm in. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very true. Almost everything that we've done. No, everything that we've done. <laughs> That not almost everything that we've done. <laughs> like I was think I was like D and DR, but like that was hugely central to D and DR. So very yeah yeah. There are a lot of good good gay pl like love stories yeah. happening mm -hmm. there. Yep. Oh, Bren Zahar. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. S oh. Silently pining into eternity. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh no. Oh Broza yeah Broza bro. <laughs> bro <laughs> It's okay. Uh, oh. uh, Joe and Drew got together, so that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I did second guess myself on those names for a second, but it's been a while. It's, it's been, been a while, been a yeah. Long time. Um, which this is a this is a great opportunity to remind ourselves just how much shit we did last year. <laughs> Four actual yeah. plays. Four that we launched last year. Very exciting. We're actually coming up. That was rapidly. twenty twenty. That was twenty nineteen, right? Yeah. D and DR was. <laughs> Oh, I see. You're making a joke. I, I oh get man, it. was my fit? was I just too deadpan? <laughs> Maybe I'm just too dense. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, it's well, it's one or both of those things. Um, you talk about time, and everyone goes, "Wait, wait, wait." wait. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Desperately clutching to the con to the vague concept of time. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, we did a lot last year. My gosh. Yeah. Um, what was I gonna say? Uh... Sorry. It's fine now. <laughs> uh, Ramble gay, gay content. It's all gay. We made four shows last year, and that's so many. <laughs> it is so many. I, that's not where I was. It's not important because I don't think it was re relevant to anything we were talking about. I was just gonna go somewhere else. <laughs> um... Living up to its namesake, this show here. Yes. One of my favorite this is this is also wholly unrelated, but one of my favorite uh content creators, one of the people who has like inspired me uh continuously throughout even before I decided to like do any of this stuff myself, uh, is Olin Rogers. Um and he ha used to have a show uh on YouTube, like a regular thing called Dr uh Rollin' with Olin, where it was just him and like one of his like his best friend just driving uh, yeah, Mr. Fizzer, Final Final Space. He's the he's the producer yeah. and creator of Final Space. Um, he uh, they, it was just him and his best friend like driving in a car with a camera and just like talking about stuff. And one of my favorite things about that it was extremely funny because it was just two friends making each other laugh. Um, and that's like some of my favorite kind of content. Mm -hmm. But my favorite thing about that show was his intro where he would say something to the it was like Welcome to Rolling with Olin, a show about anything and everything. But mostly nothing, and like that's, <laughs> and that's that's kind of oh. how I feel about Ramble Man. <laughs> so good, it's a yeah. Show about anything and everything, but mostly nothing. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, which reminds me, I need to actually get on watching Final Space because all the things I've heard about it are so positive, and I want mm -hmm. to see it. Um. Hessen says, I wish I would have known you guys were making the weird West chest before it came down. I have some old things I could have dusted off. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's a lot of fun to write. Yeah. 
and it was that was new too we hadn't that was one we hadn't uh explored yet yeah i i want to real quick while we while we're still uh we still got some time i did want to go back circle back to something we were talking about earlier which was the idea of pre-written stuff uh being useful for bringing new players into stuff um have have any of you had ex- any experience either doing that or having it um, this goes for chat too, or having it be like your entry into entry point into a system or something. Well, my first D and playing D and D was the minds of <laughs> the, that whatever. Yeah, I can't even remember. We got like two sessions in and then dropped off that uh, <laughs> game completely because our DM was. All of our friends wanted to play D and D, and one person was DMing it, and then she got too overwhelmed with having to manage two different groups oh. doing the same thing uh, and yeah. forgetting yeah. where people were and doing stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I'm not sure if I've if I've ever used. I, I mean, I know I've never used one. I don't think I've ever played in a. Like I know I've I've played in a in a session like I played a Numenera game that um, uh, was just sort of like a one shot, and I got the impression that it was pre written, but I can't re- I can't remember if it was like an official thing or if it was written by the the GM, and he just used it many times before. Like if it was his own module, I cannot remember. I think it was, and that was actually really helpful to me, um, because that was my introduction to that was the first time I'd ever played Cipher, um, was in that Numenera game. Because otherwise, I just watched it uh, on like C six, like Callisto six was the first time I'd ever um, heard of Cipher actually. Um, <clears throat> I remember the Numenera one shot. I remember that there was a giant. And there was a cave that involved a lot of weird time shenanigans. Like, time was weird there. Um, <laughs> and there were uh, there was a big ice bridge in the cave. And there were, like, chronophages. Like, these weird little, like, skittering insects that eat, that feed on time or something like that. And there was also a Whoa. big, giant ball that the giant was trying to move that it was locked in time. <laughs> That we were obsessed with for a while, but apparently had nothing to do with the actual module or the reason that we were there. But but we as, such is the way we did the player the the TTRPG player thing where we got very obsessed with uh with like the one detail that we're not supposed to interact with. Um, that's all I really remember. I know like pre written shit is how I got into DMing, mm-hmm. like D and D. Um, like I was saying earlier, like I didn't, I've never actually run a fully pre-written thing, but like I would take pre-written stuff that I found online and like take pieces of it that I liked to like, again, cobble together something that I actually wanted to run. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'd read something and be like, this doesn't interest me, but I like this part. So that'll be the main conflict. (laughs) And And so like I used, so like I would run something that I didn't really like was all pieces of things that other people had written but they weren't one thing it was like yeah i'd cut it together um it's i would say pre-written stuff is how i got get into jamming most systems like i like to like for uh before i ran it came from the loop i ran i ran i read tales from the loop modules mm-hmm. to kind of get how they had it like they had intended the stories to kind of go and like how you know you ask for like here is a challenge and whatever and like how often they should be so i like to read them to understand the story that it was intended to play but i don't necessarily run them um yeah that's i do use them to onboard myself and you know other people like i everyone right. who played it, in, it came from we, all of us it was our first time playing we'd never done anything before so i guess yeah but it's good i like it as like a, fa- to a, a foundation like i'll read i'll read modules and pre-written stuff to like get the system better and that's mm-hmm. kind of how i onboard myself yeah even if i'm not running them yeah i mostly ask because i i worked for a for an indie ttrpg company uh the year before last um was uh and 
they had a whole bunch of um it was a, it was a basically like they were a third party publisher for for Savage Worlds um and they had a whole bunch of jump starts that they'd written for their for their settings for cuz their world was sort of like a universe that had multiple settings in it um and we had several jump starts for like one for each of the core settings and i remember reading through them and <clears throat> um basically i mean it didn't they, they they i didn't see they didn't help me right like reading them they did not help me much granted i was reading them with a very different eye i wasn't reading them with the eye of a player or with the eye of a gm i was reading them with the eye of a pr person but um <laughs> but uh they still didn't i don't know i i feel like that's the that's not really how i learn so like for for me what's helpful is just like even even in terms of uh learning a system for 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 gming or whatever I learn better, like, I, if I understand how it works from reading it, but I don't really learn it until I start doing it. And it's the same way with playing. So I don't know that that's particularly helpful for me. Mm-hmm. So it might be different if it was, like, if somebody was running those for me, that might have changed things. But reading them didn't help a lot. Like, yeah, the stories of, like, those, like, pre-written stories, like, they are built usually built for running those mechanics, like, yeah. as quickly and clearly as possible and getting people really acquainted with them it like it, because like the conflicts that you encounter are solved by those mechanics so mm-hmm. it helps to like i've done what caitlin does is like read just those like pre-written stuff to help figure it out and because like for like a very rp heavy like system is going to be mechanic like gonna have a very different story to a very like a uh, combat heavy one and those stories will be like what you what the story you try to tell overall is going to be very different yeah mm. yeah um hmm. that's that's definitely true sorry i'm just sort of coming through my experience with with reading and like playing and, and like pre-written stuff and I think that makes sense to me, especially the part like as you said about like about having like everything in those in those uh, modules, like every conflict is intended to be like use this mechanic to get through this part, right? Like that makes sense. And uh, the one like the the experience that I'm thinking of right now, and this is less about like about homebrew versus like you know um, pre written stuff, but it's in terms of like si- learning a system was when I tried to learn um, uh, Outbreak Undead because I bought the book at Gen Con a couple years ago and I started trying to learn Outbreak Undead because I had an idea for a campaign that I knew even then I was never going to run. Um, But uh, I remember reading it and being like, all right, I am going to dedicate myself to learning some of these mechanics. But it was like, it was just utter nonsense. Like I understood all of the words, but I didn't understand what they meant when put together. It was just, I've had a similar experience. I also have uh, the book too. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And then my, of course, then like my English brain, like English major brain comes in and starts like getting into the really like nitty gritty of like, okay, but interpreted this way, this word could mean (laughs) this, but if I interpret it this way, it could mean this. So how does this work? And I know I think about it way too hard and like, yeah. Uh, confuse this myself. isn't really module versus mm-hmm. homebrew, but the way that I tend to onboard myself into systems because reading big chunks of text, it's really hard for me to do and stay focused on and comprehend and absorb any of it. I will watch actual plays mm-hmm. and that's how I learn systems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Like I One step removed from doing it to learn it, watching other people do it to learn it. Oh, fully. I don't think I would have picked up Cipher as as well as I did without watching like Callisto mm-hmm. Six first. Um, yeah. I don't think I would have understood it. Um, and even then, I still had a bunch of stuff that I had to like. I had to like really think hard about when I actually got it. I'm like, okay, wait, how does this work? Because <laughs> it requires a bit of a a bit of a shift from how you think about about D and D. So if all you're doing is D and D for a for a long time 
then switching to Cypher, there's you're going to have a few adjustments you have to make it's in your very mind. Different. It's a different feel, yeah. yeah. But This is unrelated, but Cypher is easily one of my favorite systems I've ever played. Like, I, I'm oh, obsessed yeah. with Cypher. <laughs> like, I really am. <laughs> yeah. It's a great system <coughs> for, like, running short content, I think, because it has less uh less potential for bloat right because you don't you're not constantly as the gm not constantly have to, having to look up stat blocks and rules and things like that um just because like uh in in D D, like you can often end up being like okay this is going to be a four hour one shot and you lie to yourself and actually believe that um and yeah <laughs> uh, and you sit and you sit there and and suddenly it turns into like six to seven hours and because there's so much bloat there's so much bloat potential with with D &D. Uh, like and i'm not saying it's bad it just means that it tends to drag on so if you're used if you're used to like shut up caitlin i know i i heard it shut up <laughs> <laughs> i heard it as soon as i said it, it. didn't say anything you run it up <laughs> <laughs> I did unmute my mic because I was going to repeat it, but you stopped me. So anyway. There you go. You win that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> as soon as I said it, I looked at your face because I knew it was coming. Um, but yeah, no, like it, it tends to, it tends to, uh, to, to go much, it tends to be a lot harder to like plan for specific amounts of time. Whereas Cypher, because there's less stuff for the, for the GM to specifically do, you can much more accurately plan how much time something is going to take, which is, yeah, one of the, the advantages I think of like rules light systems in general. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. Sorry, I was just looking at chat again. Mr. Fizzer says, I'm so happy to find the Cypher love here. I've been alone for so long. I'm so glad because... You're Cypher, in the right place. You're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Like, I think... I think uh, Infinite Horizon certainly was the thing that, that really kicked... Like, watching people play Cypher is like, oh, that's cool. I like this. I like this system. It's kind of interesting. But you don't really get how useful some of the like and how well designed some parts of it are until you're playing it mm -hmm. um and so like playing infinite horizon definitely did that but i also feel like because we played infinite horizon we have now found our new favorite system yep. right it's not fully like, biased it's, i'm fine no i'm fully yeah. biased but i'm i love Cyber. oh no I'm, what I, no i'm actually what i'm saying is that like infinite horizon was the vehicle to us finding oh, our new yes. favorite system not yes, that we correct. love it it's that we're not in the, like it's not a phase mom like it's just, yeah. it's it's <laughs> Actually, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and clipped, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. um, yeah, no, you are definitely uh in the right corner of the internet. We love Cypher, here. yeah, so much. Yeah, I have so many things that see because, like, I feel like for the natural like trajectory in D&D is you play out, you play out your version of Lord of the Rings right and then you're like okay but what if i did something else and then you try to like you go you at least this is what i did anyway like then i start like doing uh like somersaults in my mind trying to figure out how to make D, &D do star wars or something like that and it's like okay how do i uh, da, da. and then you and then eventually you realize you try it and you realize oh wait this is a bad idea this doesn't work <laughs> But yeah, absolutely. I've, and that's why Cypher is great. Mm -hmm. Shoehorning things into D&D &D because I had never played, mm -hmm. I had only ever played like D&D &D and like Weave right away. My first two systems that I played for like the first couple of years I was into tabletop RPGs. Like we played, we put, we played a, 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 a homestead game in D&D, &D, which like, I think it would have fit much better in like any other system but those were the yeah. ones that was what we had right, been yeah. playing at that point yeah. so like we made it work it was extremely fun and very cool what we what like we did with it and what burn was able to like structure in as far as like the leveling up and stuff but like like the levels was really cool but the i think coming up with a more unique uh and not fantasy based I, think, I feel like, like we could have with the with the cipher sentences. I think we could have specialized our characters a little bit more. And like, <laughs> I think the problem that we always kept coming up on is the spells, especially. Yeah. yeah. And I think that D and D spells are really unique and really cool, but they are not 
like utilitarian in they're their design not, yeah. for things besides combat. They are not so. genre agnostic either. They're yes. very, very D and D. Yeah, I think it would have yeah. been fun. Like, I think Cipher would have suited us really well. Like, especially like going like God tier and putting us at like tier like fifteen or something, which doesn't really exist in Cipher. Like, you can keep going, but like there's only like one through six and then we would just have all this whatever i think it would have been really cool this is not the place to talk about this but, <laughs> but like I, we have experience of shoehorning things into DD because that's just what you know and that's one other what reason cypher is so cool is because it, it is it is fully genre agnostic like you can put anything in this mm -hmm. it's i i keep thinking of new things i'm like that would be really cool in cypher <laughs> yeah well mm -hmm. that's the thing and that's 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 what i was gonna that's what i was getting at is that cypher is i think my new favorite system my favorite system now because I have like it is effortless to create any game, any genre, any genre that you want. Just oh, it's it's a full of effort game. That is one of the me mechanics that's built into the system. I see, I see what you did there. <laughs> I, I see you. <laughs> I just wanted to interrupt you to be a dick. <laughs> Sorry, Lucas. <laughs> that's fine. I I interrupted your interruption. Can we just earlier, simul so. simul sip. Yeah. Possibly. I was too busy being annoyed by Caitlin, so. <laughs> but yes, there's much, much effort to be had. Much effort to be had. Oh, gosh. Um, all right. Well. It's a great system, though. It is. We <laughs> are approximately 10 minutes past our, our end time, so I think that makes it almost time to stop. So... <laughs> Um, Almost. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but we will attempt mm. uh, to do so. Uh, you don't. I'm sorry, I just my brain just did a weird thing. I was gonna say I'll just follow through on that. You don't land a plane without first slowly lowering down because if you try that, you crash. So we're going to wind down. We're going to. Low, <laughs> reduce altitude. I'm sorry, this metaphor Redu yeah, that was immediately gonna say, got away altitude. from me. <laughs> just immediately, like <laughs> as soon as I started. It's great. Keep going. I want to see where this, this goes. Is, all right, let's see what. Let's see how many holes I can dig myself into here. Something um, about a runway. Like, and yeah, wheels we, we gotta, and we gotta turbulence because we don't want to crash we'll on the landing we at crash about on the freeway during rush hour and uh, cause all kinds of devastation. About 55 degrees and uh, so weather's nice. To that end. <laughs> Where we, land, where we landed, Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. We can end this. Very wild. Started. Very wild, and you know, <laughs> planes in the no. bay. What planes? Well, well, there's a joke there somewhere, but I'm not hey. smart enough to make it. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you, well, that's it. <laughs> It's been, who it's been a long time since I since I would have fully rendered myself incapable of hosting the uh, any show. Um, <clears throat> Man, that was a bit. I, that's generous. I don't. I wouldn't even call. No, <laughs> I'm still laughing at Feywild plain joke. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't even a joke. It was just infer a punchline. <laughs> Honestly, that's my favorite kind of humor is just inferred humor. <laughs> it's a something, something, plain, something, something, Feywild. You get the joke. And it's still funny. <laughs> like you, you, see, you, see what, you see what I'm getting at here. You see what I'm getting at. Um, <laughs> I trust you to be smart enough to understand the depths of my humor. So here's the pieces of it. You put it together yourself. Some assembly required. Yeah. Here's a joke some assembly required. Like. <laughs> Ikea's is a comedy bit store now. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, usually that's me. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'm just really tired. You guys. <clears throat> I need to take a nap and I need my juice box. And, um... <laughs> Capri Sun. Yeah, Capri Sun, exactly. Capri the Capri Sun? Um, <laughs> little explodey, explodey uh, things that once you finish, you still blew air into for some reason. Oh, uh, yeah. And the, you do the, that? More, the longer you did it, the grosser it got. Yeah. Um, True. True. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. 
Geek Out says, what I love about Lucas's sense of humor is that he allows us to put the joke together ourselves and it's <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Bringing us full circle back around to the, uh, the idea of pre-written content. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I just give you the pieces of the joke so that you can put it together in whatever order you wish. <laughs> we're, Frankenstein- I, we're Frankensteining bits here. Because That's what I mean. trust you to be able to make something way funnier than I could have. Um, <laughs> so, uh, before we uh, con- you know, continue to just drive the stream further and further into the hole that we dug for ourselves. And by we, I mean me. Um, <clears throat> let's end this stream. Um, Freeman, you have a bunch of stuff that you probably want to talk about related to this channel. Oh, I certainly will try. So we are affiliates on Twitch, which I, I, we haven't mentioned for a while, mm-hmm. but I'm mentioning it. If you didn't know, now you know. Sometimes I forget, Me too. honestly, because we, <laughs> we haven't said it for a while in our announcements. Uh, if you like what you see with our shows and us, there's ways to support us. The ways are Patreon. There's Patreon, which, as you know, we talked about the tabletop tool chest. We have that. It's an every other week we come up with little uh, story p- pieces um, you can insert in your story or you can just throw in your game. If you're kind of coming up against a roadblock, put it there. Um, I believe on the 2nd of February is going to be our next one. It's going to be modern fantasy NPCs. So look out for that. It'd be really cool. It I is? believe that's what it is. I hope it I, is. I like, this is, this yes, is one of those is. where we planned our, our whole month and immediately as soon as we did it, out of my brain like well, i it's just because we pl- we did everything in one s- in one <laughs> sitting and then yeah then like the decompression you know but in any case yeah i think it is modern fantasy npcs okay, cool so it'd be really cool um er, and we have also on the world building tier on the patreon where we have world builders that's really awesome and uh, a lot of world building in this in uh, infant horizon our ttrpg actual play that's happening now and also end of month media if you Other watch ways... me scream and die at the end of the last episode, yes. it's because of writers <laughs> yeah. or the, the Patreon world builders. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. So... so if you want to know what that was about, get involved. <laughs> get, get in there. Get involved. You too <laughs> can cause Caitlin that level of excitement. Uh <laughs> We also have a coffee, which is a short-term, a way to support us in our short-term goals, um, supporting our artists, getting our artists and getting our art and music and stuff like that. Super cool. And our, um, not emojis. I don't, I don't want to call them that. That's not what they are, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just gener- Emotes, general channel, like art assets and things like that. <clears throat> That's super cool. And also we have a merch store where we have our new edition, our hoodie. I'm gonna put it back on the screen real quick. Yeah, because it's very cool, and I just really. I, I'm yes. I, I keep meaning to say that I want to get one, and I keep forgetting. But I do want to get one. Yeah, it's got the new art. We also have uh, this mug. You'll see it at some point. <laughs> the art, by the way, done by Caitlin, right here. Done by Caitlin. She did that. That's me. <laughs> I love season two mason art Mm -hmm. so much it's very cool it was fun to do all of the new art i think we've talked before but i had done like 30 character arts for some other stuff for the while so i was like these these are better (laughs) i've improved (laughs) um oh and sorry there last but not least the discord check out the discord we have the channels where you can check out um, us yelling at each other or getting yelled at, uh, Infinite Horizon channel and etc. It's also a good place to be, you know, be appraised and notified of what's going on in our programming. You can keep up that way. And general chat is always a lovely place to start off the day with a good morning. I always see it and I'm always feeling really good that day. So thank you so much. It's a really wholesome community. You guys are really amazing. I love you all. Yeah. Agreed. If you're a subscriber, you should be in the Discord because then you get cool Patreon stuff yes. rewards. Yeah. yeah, you have a bunch of the ba- bunch of the backlog of the uh, media. Yeah, end of month media. Yep, I think there's yeah, so cool. Another thing that we I don't think we mentioned this enough about Patreon, but occasionally you will also get like yeah. uh, uh, channel announcements earlier than everybody else, so you don't. Oh yeah, that's right. Like not not always. 
um, because we will usually sort of, usually our announcements, like, when we're ready to announce stuff is when we announce them. Um, Like, but, but occasionally we have let our patrons know about things ahead of time like um with the like the cast announcement for it came from the loop for instance or um i think they got the character art early too yeah. for that too they met the they met all the characters early they got to see all the cast early yep. so that's pretty cool yeah so uh if you uh if you like many of us struggle with requiring immediate gratification uh you should join the page <laughs> um i am of course Speaking of myself. Um, yes, Rose says also the Infinite Horizon character journals. That's definitely something we also do. Some fun um, supplementary materials. Yeah. All right. Um, Remy, thanks for coming on. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you and what uh, what you're doing. Uh, what I'm you can Rem- talk about. Yeah. I'm Remy Post on literally everything i'm trying to change it all over to that so you can find me on twitter on gonna try streaming on twitch soon again under remy post i post a lot of my art on remy post i'm open for commissions uh if you want a one of those portraits that i mentioned that i did like a shit ton of for storm king's thunder i opening the style of that for uh commissions if you would like a neato character portrait I make plushies. Doing... Yeah, make a lot of plushies too. Yeah. I oh, they're so cool. <laughs> they're so they're so good. I love them. Anyone oh, who wow. isn't on my channel has is like, what is that? But if anyone knows my channel, they <laughs> Remy made this for yeah. me. <laughs> oh. so, I'm open for commissions on that. I I I am a multimedia artist nightmare and I do like everything. So I'll if I'm doing it, I'm gonna post it on my Twitter, so follow me there. <laughs> I loved the the little um, Among Us little guys that you made, yeah. and when you posted that, they got magnetic feet. That's so oh, cute. That is, oh, that is so. I literally cool. just pulled it off of my lamp. Oh, my <laughs> oh God. magnetic so, feet. They hang on yeah. stuff. Oh, it's so I cute. Can't have, I don't want to pull that my lamp down because is... it'll be bad. But... You just have to check out Remy's sure. Twitter and see photos of it and follow him yeah. there. Oh my gosh. Um... Yes, yeah, sorry, Geekut's asking. Yes, Remy. This is Remy made. Remy made the chat hugs. <laughs> It's so good. Love that. Uh, all right. Well, uh, and Caitlin, you just to remind everybody uh, what you're doing soon. Um, you, you can catch me on Sunday on twitch.tv slash qtimes, and we are going to be doing a one-shot with the Power Play cast joined by Darren DePaul to punch Nazis and raise money for the Southern Poverty Law Center, and it's going to be so much fun, and you don't have to have seen any of Power Play because um, it's you are not going to be seeing the regular characters the cast of characters we're all and i don't know what else i'm allowed to say so i'm gonna leave it at that but it's gonna be very cool and it's gonna be a four-hour charity stream um it's going to be very fun and i hope you will all come and hang out because i'm very excited about it yeah all right well we are going to go i think we're actually gonna go raid uh rachel seeley is streaming overwatch right now so i think we're gonna go we're gonna go raid rachel um and so yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna go do that. So um, I'm gonna set that up right now. Great. Okay. Cool. It's it's going. All right, everybody. Um, so we will see you uh, hopefully on Tuesday for uh, for Into Deep, the beginning of our of our week's programming. But if not, we'll see you the next time you decide to come roll with us. Good night and good zone, everybody. Bye.